Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, uh, starting about two minutes late today. So thanks for joining us uh, at You've Got the Power. Focus today is going to be on an interesting type of craniocervical instability, uh, basically where the skull is falling backwards as you bring your head back to look up. And we'll go through that. And then, uh, as usual, I'll give a short presentation and then uh, answer any questions either about that topic or any other topic that you might have. And then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So again, today's topic uh, is uh, CCI type 1C, and that's where the head uh, or the skull comes backwards relative to C1, and we'll learn what causes that, uh, which ligaments are involved, uh, what we might want to do for treatment, all of that good stuff. So let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen. Hopefully I did this better than last time. So I'm going to go to entire screen. That should work. And then... Go here. Okay, so today topic uh, is the skull slipping backwards with cervical extension, CCI type 1C. So these are the references that we'll be working off of today. And before we get started, I've said this a number of times, you know, our call center is very busy and at the clinic and focused on lots of different issues, shoulders, ankles, knees, uh, low backs, et cetera. So when it comes to CCI, we find that a lot of our CCI patients need that extra touch from an expert. So rather than filling out a form on the Centeno Schultz or Regenix websites, I'd recommend that you just contact Carla directly, and that's my assistant. Uh, that's her email address right there. And she can help sort things out to try to get all the right information together for a telemedicine. And she can usually do it in much shorter time uh, than going through the call center who handles mostly different kinds of things. So today, again, we're going to be going through the CCI scale that I put together. Um, and this is kind of the unique thing. I was talking to someone today about this. No one has ever really put together uh, a, a CCI typing uh, organizational chart like I've put together here. You know, we tend to have the surgeons that are in individual types of niche CCIs and then uh, the C1C2 overhang type of CCI. Uh, and since digital motion x-ray machines tend to be owned by chiropractors, that sort of niches out that group. Uh, and then so lots of different things, but no one's really talking about the different types of CCI that uh, someone could have and uh, which specific ligaments are involved and might need to be targeted from a non-surgical standpoint. So again, just to review, this type 1 CCI goes to 0 and 1, uh, this type 2 CCI refers to one, two. This type three CCI refers to two, three. And then you've got the, you know, the different actual types out here. So a 1A, 1B, et cetera. So today we're gonna to talk about one C. So the basic concept with this type of CCI is that the skull, as someone brings their head back, their skull slips backwards. Uh, and that's the basic idea, not a complex uh, issue from the standpoint of uh, what's happening. Obviously, it may be a complex issue from the standpoint of how to fix it. So this is from the grading scale that I put together that talks about all of this. Uh, and realize that it seems like the biggest single cause, based on what I've observed in this type of instability, again, where we have the skull shifting backwards, or it can also shift forwards, but we're talking about the one that goes backwards today, uh, is this shallow, ox shallow occipital condyle. 
So realize that you have these condyles that come off the skull and they sit in uh, C1. And if the joint is normal, this is the C0-C1 facet joint, it looks like this one uh, that I just pointed to there. And that is you've got a fairly robust occipital condyle. So the occipital condyle is this part that I'm outlining right now. Just make sure that there's no problems here. Got it. Um, and then that goes into the C1, which also has a sort of shallow ball and socket. Now, as you might imagine, that provides some bony resistance to motion, uh, and that's its job. Obviously, there are ligaments around that that support uh, keeping your skull firmly attached to C1. But what happens if you're born with an occipital condyle that's flat and looks more like this one uh, on the left here, or my left? And what happens there is you don't have that type of stability. Uh, so basically, you become dependent on your ligaments. And all these numbers here, while this looks complex, it's really not. It's just the depth of the condyle divided by the width of the condyle. And that gives us a, a number, a ratio of the depth to the width. Uh, the higher the ratio, the deeper the condyle and the better it's going to function. The lower the ratio, um, the more likely the condyle is to slide uh, so these are the, the numbers from the Labuda paper. Basically, uh, patients with these kinds of condyles were symptomatic. Patients with uh, better condyles were asymptomatic. And then there's an overlap in the middle where you're not quite sure uh, which group they belong to. Um, so that's why all these numbers are sitting here for my purposes on this, this uh, type uh, CCI type scale that I put together. And we can obviously look at the condyles and we can try to see that things are lined up. But if we want to see that the skull is, in fact, moving, a really good way to do it is to draw a line. So if we draw a line straight up here uh, and we put that line uh, touching, just touching the basion here. Uh, and that line goes down to the dens. When you extend, uh, that's not supposed to move more than a millimeter. So you can see here now the basion, the tip of that has moved forward uh, because the skull has moved backward. And the same thing can happen in flexion as well, right? That basion can move forward. So again, you're not supposed to get more than one millimeter of motion uh, between that basion and the line that goes down to the dens. So uh, that's a good way to measure that this is in fact occurring. So this is a cross section of all the deep ligaments. And as you can see, there's lots of them, right? We got the PAOM coming from the back here as we go forward. Then we've got the tectorial membrane there and then the cruciate ligament as we go forward of that. And then the apical dens ligament and then the AAOM as we go forward of that, and finally the SAAOL. So if you think about it for a second, if this skull is gonna move this way or move that way, really a lot of ligaments are gonna be involved, right? Uh, if the skull is gonna move backwards, then that PAOM would certainly be involved. Uh, you could certainly see that the apical ligament's gonna be involved. The AAOM might be involved, the SAAOL might be involved. So your safest move here in dealing with the skull moving forwards or backwards is going to be to hit all of these ligaments. Uh, obviously from the back, that could be simple uh, prolotherapy with x-ray guidance and contrast um, or PRP or bone marrow or whatever, but you know, just hitting that ligament and making sure you're in the ligament. And then from the front, that's more of that PICL procedure to get all of those 
ligaments. And again, if we just focus on those upper ligaments, this is what it looks like. I took everything else out of there. Also realize that since the C0-C1 joint is really taking the brunt of this movement, it's going to be none too happy and probably have some early arthritis, depending on how long this is going on. So that's got to be injected as well. And that's a higher level injection to inject that joint. Uh, it requires contrast, digital subtraction, angiography. And someone that does it, you know, at least 100 times a year. Uh, so they're really, really good at it. And it's the problem is that that's a hard one to, to find. And then some other injection targets uh, would be these lateral occipital ligaments. And there's even a few more that I'll go over in subsequent Facebook Lives that are much less talked about. But I don't want to introduce them yet until I introduce them through a video first. So we're just going to leave it at these lateral atlanto occipital ligaments. Now, this is a very hard one to inject as well because the vertebral artery comes right here and then it snakes there, and then it goes up to your brain. So obviously you need to be very, very good to hit this ligament and stay away from that guy. Um, so not, not simple. So let's go through a patient example um, because this is a really interesting upright MRI. And also, you know, you might think I've got DMX on the brain, right? I really don't. This is one of those types of instability where I usually get more valuable information from a well-done upright MRI with flexion and extension than I do a DMX. Uh, so this is one of those really uh, great uses of an upright MRI with neck flexion and extension. So before you look at these numbers, there's something going on here that's super interesting. And the first thing I want to focus your attention on is where this arrow points to. So this is the back of the atlas. So this is C1 here. Uh, this is going to be that posterior lumbar occipital membrane and dura coming down this way. And the front of the atlas lives up here. So this is, this is C1 that I'm drawing out. So inflection, that looks pretty normal. Uh, but then we go to the extension view, and there's something that just totally changed here. Um, now, let me just draw it for you here. So if this is the back of C1, now we got something else going on. We, we, we now draw the PAOM out, and the PO, PAOM has got this humongous bulge in it that wasn't present in flexion. Uh, so how did that happen? Well, there's only two possibilities. Either the skull went back or the atlas went forward. We know the atlas didn't go forward because if we look at this, that really hasn't changed all that much up front. So what happened is the skull went backwards here relative to the atlas. Um, and we could also look at this clavoaxial angle in extension, which is very, very high. Um, at 175. So anytime we get into that mid 170s in uh, extension, we would be possibly concerned that we're dealing with something going on between the skull and the spine. Now, what's also interesting is if we go over a couple images, we see something else going on here that looks not good. Uh, so the first thing we see is this guy has no uh, has no condyle depth. So basically, if we trace these, he's got a very flat C0, C1 joint. That makes sense. That's what causes one of the things that can cause the skull to slide. And here we can see how flat it is. Remember, that should be a, a shallow ball and socket, meaning C0 should go into C1. So I'll draw what a normal one would look like. So a normal one would have a C0 that did this, and then a C1 that did that. So C0, 
C1. So that's what a normal one looks like. And obviously, as we look at the one that's here, it's not like that at all. It's a flat joint. Also, the white inside that joint, where I've pointed to here, is an effusion. So it's swelling in the joint. And we also can see that the front of the joint doesn't match up at all. This is the front of the zero one joint. This is the front, or I'm sorry, the zero or the occipital condyle, sorry, and C1. So these don't match up. So clearly the skull again has gone backward from looking at this picture. So everything lines up here. This is a C0, C1, type 1C uh, sliding type instability. So translational sliding type instability of the skull on C1 or the skull on the atlas. So what kind of injections would we be talking about here? Um, basically these uh, five-star injections that we've talked about before, because we're gonna need to do that PICL. Uh, not that we're as concerned about the ALR transverse, but we're gonna have to get into all those front ligaments up here. And that's the only route to do that. Uh, and then obviously we've got to get the deep ligaments from the back, things like PAOM, it will help to get those AO ligaments as well. So before I wrap this up and go to questions, again, I'll just say this one more time. If you're interested in getting any kind of evaluation, Carla Salas is the person to reach out to. That's my assistant. Um, I would not go through uh, the clinic call center or filling out a form online, uh, but just send an email to Carla and she can help you. So let's go to questions now and see if we've got some. Again, you can ask questions about this or really anything else at all. It doesn't have to be about this topic in particular. Uh, so Ulysses, uh, if you have muscle spasms in the whole cervical spine, is there a possible chance arthritis develops if uh, left untreated? So muscle spasms themselves, Ulysses, um, shouldn't really cause problems, but it's generally what they represent. So in general, muscle spasms tend to be uh, compensatory for instability, and instability can cause arthritis over time. So assuming that what it is we're uh, talking about is instability, then the answer to your question is yes. Uh, Jim uh, is using 15X Amber inhibitory for healing for a person in their 20s. You know, it's a good question, uh, Jim. When we've studied it, we saw a slight inhibitory effect uh, and we weren't clear on whether the effect that we were observing was actual inhibition or not. So I've always erred on the side of being careful. So for example, if someone comes in who's in their 20s, we wouldn't use uh, 15X, uh, 4X would be just fine. Now in their 30s, you know, we're going to jump that up to, let's say, mid 30s and a joint to 10x. And by the time we get a patient in their mid 40s, we're all the way up at usually 14 or 15x. So as you can see, when patients are very young, they really don't need that type of concentration. Um, is it overkill or is it inhibitory? My overall sense is it could be inhibitory. And I've always erred on the side of being careful there. Andy, how much PRP do you have to inject into a facet capsule to get a healing response? Um, well, let's break that uh, question down. So the first issue is facet capsule. Usually patient or people really aren't injecting facet capsules. Um, what they're doing is facet capsule is their euphorism for I put the needle somewhere in the vicinity of the facet joint, but I've got no idea where it is um, and whether it's really going into your facet capsule. So that's the first thing. So 99% of what's described as a facet capsule injection isn't into the facet capsule. It's a needle placed somewhere in the vicinity of the facet joint, and the person has no idea if it's going outside the joint into the tendons or muscles, into the facet capsule, or into the joint. Now, for the 1% of injections that are described that way, where the doctor is trying to specifically inject the facet capsule, um, either under ultrasound or with contrast, then not much, probably about a half cc 
should be more than enough. Uh, Ulysses, can the SI can SI joint sclerosis be the reason why hip arthritis happens a lot? Not quite sure of the question. Um, uh, we certainly see patients with hip problems who have SI joint instability. Uh, so you may want to rephrase that one. Uh, Jim, do you think the physical therapy world or in the physical therapy world, there's an overemphasis on strengthening the deep neck flexors and lack of emphasis on strengthening the suboccipital muscles? Um, yeah, Jim, I think that's largely historical. If you go back to deep neck flexor work, that's largely was largely initially put out there by Gwendolyn Jull uh, from Australia. I don't know if Gwen's still practicing now or not. Um, that was about 20 years ago. And uh, it's a very good program, but obviously you've got other muscles back here that need to be strengthened too. So I, I would kind of agree with you that there is this uh, focus on the front because that kind of program was described by an excellent, I'm gonna turn the look down here a little bit, by an excellent research-based uh, physical therapist, Gwendolyn Jull, um, but the strengthening for the suboccipitals or the extensors, uh, a little bit less common. So I tend to agree with you there. Arno, I already asked this earlier, but is complete exposure of the C1, C2 facet a strong indicator of instability or not? Uh, so you, I think we had some confusion on that last time, if I recall. Um, do you mean that there's a rotational study and that you are seeing the entire um, superior or inferior articular process, or do you mean something else? Let me get some more information on that. Lisi, uh, is there going to be another Regenix conference about CCI more in the future? Uh, no, Regenix conference is on CCI. We had a Regenix conference last week that where we focused on sort of administrative things and then some clinical issues, but not CCI. This patient population is way, way too specialized uh, and requires specialized, the development of specialized skills that just are very difficult to develop. So no, not anytime soon. Uh, I don't think that would be a safe thing to do. Uh, Andy, for posterior instability injections, is there a strength difference between PRP versus BMC? Are they similar in strength where one PRP treatment provides the same results as one BMC treatment? Um, not in my experience. So I, I think the best way I've used to describe that is if you've got a woman with SI joint instability, uh, it takes about six to eight prolotherapy treatments to get that person stable. If you switch to PRP, you can half that, so three to four. And if you switch to bone marrow concentrate, you can half that. So now we're talking about one to two. Uh, so that's uh, that's what that looks like uh, based on my experience. Um, so PRP is better than prolotherapy, but not nearly as good as bone marrow concentrate as far as getting ligaments tight quickly. Jim, if the upper cervical muscles have wasted away, can strengthen the back up, cause them to return back to the original size? How long would it take? No one knows the answer to that, Jim. Uh, the research initially was done by Jim Elliott uh, at uh, Northwestern. Uh, Jim used to be work with us as a physical therapist. The, he then went back and got his PhD um, in Australia, then came back to the States to be a professor uh, at Northwestern. Uh, so he would be the one to ask that question, whether or not they've done any research showing that you can reverse that trend on the atrophy. Uh, is it possible or how long would it take? Probably take a year or more to get those muscles back to where they would need to be. Because if you look at it, many of these patients that, uh, we diagnose this in have 80% atrophy of the muscle or more. So if you just think about um, an intellectual challenge, if you will, let's say uh, I took your, your leg and I put it in a cast for six months, then we took it out of the cast. And your quadricep muscle, your front thigh muscle was 80% smaller. As you might imagine, even walking around the block is going to be tough to do. 
And if we go forward on that, it's going to take a very, very long time, at least six months to a year before you feel like you've gotten that back. And that's going to be hard work. Let's see, can muscle atrophy cause mild scoliosis? Uh, good question. Nobody knows at this point. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad thesis, though. John, just out of curiosity, is the C1C2 ligament and flavum a more thicker ligament compared to the PAOM? Um, so the PAOM is just the extension of the ligament and flavum. So it's not a separate ligament. It just has a different name. So you could also call the C1, C2 section ligament and flavum because it's called the C2 or it's called ligament and flavum at C2, 3. Um, but it's uh, it's the same ligament, just a different name. Uh, Arno, what is your opinion on the risk associated with the CT scan to check for CCI? If my doctor thinks it's worth a shot to do a rotational CT, is it worth it? Um, it's a lot of x-ray exposure, so it's about 100 chest x-rays, uh, radiation exposure, um, uh, to get a CT scan. So it's, that's a, it's a lot of radiation exposure. Now, is it worth it? Um, you know, it, it can show rotational instability, uh, but in my experience, that's pretty uncommon that it shows rotational instability greater than uh, 56 degrees at C1, C2. Um, in addition, my guess is most of the people aren't doing it right because you got to take the patient's head and bring it as far over as you can and tape it in that direction. Um, so there are probably better ways to try to find instability, um, including an upright MRI with flexion and extension. You can also try to do the same rotation. doesn't work quite as well because, again, you got to bring the person's head over and tape it to the right or tape it to the left. It's not just look right and look left. Ulysses, do you recommend your patients not see a chiropractor after the procedure? Um, no, we uh, they see uh, AO chiropractors uh, all the time uh, or NUCA. Uh, Ulysses, what imaging in your opinion is the best detector for CCI instability um, in any part? Well, it would be different for different parts of the body. When it comes to CCI, I think the highest likelihood of finding instability in this area would be DMX and then upright MRI with flexion extension. As far as the rest of it, that's like a whole lecture in of itself. Uh, Regenix submitted advanced by Isabel Anderson, high doctor intent on a 30 year old woman who has HEDS, CCI, SI joint instability, chronic migraines and POTS. I've had six cervical PRP injections or last year, and according to my DMX studies, my C1C2 overhang has gone from uh, 13 to 2. As a, as I still have debilitating symptoms, my doctor and I are debating more PRP injections versus 20% prolo injected identically to my previous rounds of PRP. We can say prolo because I typically take 12 plus weeks to respond. Um, yeah, so the first thing is I'd have to look at the DMX studies. Um, if we're talking about a lateral overhang, then we've got to make sure that you're getting the same degree of side bending um, to even compare those two studies. So that's the first thing we do. Assuming that's the case and it's gone down that much and you still have debilitating symptoms, then again, the next question would be what else is causing your symptoms, which could be things like problems with the C0, C1 joint, which are probably not getting injected, the C1, C2 joint, various nerves uh, that are getting banged into, irritated, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As far as switching to 20% prolo, um, a lot would depend on how you're going to deliver that. So you'd have to be extremely careful because if you, in for instance, if you inject PRP inadvertently into the vertebral artery, Probably no harm, no foul in most patients. Um, but if you inject 20% dextrose inadvertently into the vertebral artery, you've got a dead patient or a, certainly a, a patient that's never going to function again like a normal human being after that happens because that's uh, hypertonic enough to kill the vertebral artery off and kill whatever uh, 
brain cells that that goes to in the cerebellum, for example. Um, so lots and lots to unpack there. Um, and so I'd need to know a lot more about what was injected, how it was injected, um, whether or not we have an accurate measurement of 13 to 2, meaning whether or not you got the same uh, side bending each time, uh, all of that good stuff. Uh, Ulysses, I've always have headaches on the right side. Uh, can it be due to an upper facet joints moving with muscle spasms pulling on it? Uh, the 0, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 3 cervical facets can cause uh, headaches. So that's one possibility. Uh, there's about uh, 15, 20 different musculoskeletal causes of headache, but that's that's a couple of them for sure. Uh, Fatchen, can the skull slide on one side like right? Yeah, so uh, as far as... C0, C1 sliding, we've not seen that, um, but type 2B would be that lateral sliding at 1, 2, and that one's pretty common. Fatchen, can the seasonal flu temporarily increase symptoms of instability like dizziness, lightheadedness, tachycardia? Yeah, I think more the inflammation that you get with a flu or really any infection. So realize that, you know, everyone thinks that inflammatory responses like new with COVID. No, we, we, that's been reported in the medical literature for more than 100 years. So any type of viral infection that you get, any type of bacterial infection you get, you get a pro-inflammatory stimulus um, or that malaise uh, and this sort of uh, body pain. Now, areas you've injured in the past or are currently injured tend to light up the most when you have that kind of total body inflammation. Uh, Regenix been advanced by Tiffany Lee. I was going to do PRP by a local doctor, but I found out he was only going to C down, C2 down, uh, and I have C1, C2. Am I correct? There would be no benefit to that. Yeah, unlikely to be benefit to that. So uh, if you've got high upper cervical instability, you would need that high upper cervical area treated. Um, that would be at least one, two, could be zero, one as well. You know, just realize, uh, as we've been talking about here, if one, two gets injected, that needs to be with x-ray guidance, contrast, and digital subtraction and geography, and someone who does that, I don't know, 100 times a year or something like that. Uh, Era, uh, good day, Dr. Centeno. I think I have this. The back of my skull is continuously tilted backwards and downwards. The front side of my face uh, more upward and, and latched in the vertebra in my mouth and being weighed down and pushed bent forwards. The Vista therapy collar doesn't help with it or better support this type of instability. Are there better ways to support the back side of a head with a collar? Um, yeah, so you may, you know, I always tell patients the best thing to do these days, uh, depending on where you are in the world, obviously, in the United States, the best thing to do is to go on Amazon. There are more uh, types of cervical collars on Amazon that are inexpensive uh, than you can easily list. So you would want to look for one that has much better support in the back, uh, something maybe like a Miami J collar, that kind of thing. Um it's been advanced by ERA uh, Hype. Uh, good day, Dr. Centeno. Can this cause you to be unable to look down, as in physically unable to tilt your head downward? Because that's what I have. I cannot look downwards. Rotating left and right is limited, but don't do that at all. So it's possible, yes. Now, that could also be other types of instability as well, uh, that uh, one uh, A and B type, mostly the one A where you get the high claboaxial angle when you look down, uh, or uh, could be a two A where the transverse ligament is allowing the dens to come backwards, or it could be this one C where the skull is moving forward. So lots of different types of instability have that problem associated with them, the problem with looking down. Uh, Ulysses, can you make a video for patients about what type of questions they ask the pain management or sports medicine doctor for CCI before they decide to do this procedure? 
Um, I don't think the average pain management or sports medicine doctor is going to understand much it is of what we're talking about. Um, this is extremely specialized stuff. A um, little bit like if you go to the average neurosurgeon and say, I've got CCI, I want you to fuse my neck. They're going to look at you like you're insane, meaning um, it's not what they do all day. They don't really ever look at that part of the spine unless they're getting called into the ER and someone's head's about to fall off. Um, but understanding uh, someone who has an injury short of that but is disabled by it and what surgery to do and how to diagnose that isn't going to happen in neurosurgery and orthopedic spine offices. They're just not going to understand it. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. It's just because they don't do it all day. They don't see it all day. Same thing here. If you walk into the average sports medicine doctor, they're not going to have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, it's been advanced by era hype. I think I got that already. I think, uh, Rosalind, what is sandwiched between the occipital condyle and the C1 facet? Is it just bone or is there something that restricts friction? Um, yeah, so it would be the occipital condyle going into the bottom of the facet joint. So the, the whole thing, and there's cartilage in there, just like any other joint. Now realize that uh, you bring up the sandwich because that's a pretty good thing to talk about. The the ligament stability, a good portion of it, of what's happening in that C0, C1 joint. Um, I, we talked about the bony stability, but the ligament stability would be those alar ligaments as well, coming from the bottom and going up to the top. Um, so they're holding onto the skull and the sandwich in the middle, the piece of baloney in the middle, if you will, um, is the atlas. So the top of the sandwich would be the skull, the baloney in the middle would be the C1 atlas and the bottom piece of bread would be C2. And uh, so that's a good analogy, sort of a sandwich, because there is a sandwich effect that keeps that C0, C1 joint and the 1, 2 joint stable. Uh, Regenix been advanced by Sherry Kopp. Will you be publishing this guide to CCI types? My brother is a doc and is incredibly interested in the little I could tell him. Yeah, so I'm working on a peer-reviewed publication now. Um, not a lot of progress on it the week before last. This last week, not so much, just because I'm catching up from the conference I was at. Uh, but I should be able to make some more progress on it. Probably won't get submitted till probably summer sometime. And then hopefully it gets published by fall or so. And uh, then we can give uh, him a copy. Now, there is a video on that provisional uh, CCI typing uh, that I did maybe three or four videos ago. Uh, and uh, so you can send them that in the meantime, or just wait till the peer reviewed publication comes out. Regenics been advanced by Jeremy Robb. Is there a specific treatment for all of these different types of CCI? Yes. So that's what we've been talking about for the last six weeks or so. Uh, each one of these types has a specific set of ligament targets uh, in order to help that type of instability. So the first part is diagnosis. What are the different types of instability that someone has? Um, the second part is that then dictates which structures get injected. Uh, Arno, what type of symptoms would be associated with the abnormalities you showed in the patient case during today's slides? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, one of the things that uh, Labuda brings up in his paper, and that's the shallowness of the occipital condyle, is a, a theory that because the rectus capitis posterior minor is getting yanked on, uh, and that connects into the dura, that leads to increased stiffness of the dura, and that leads to uh, increased CSF pressures. And then that leads to headaches. So it's an interesting theory. Um, obviously, that's a lot less proven than what than the data they showed, i.e., the data was, is there something about the condyle that separates patients from controls? But it is an interesting theory. So obviously, headaches would be one of those, but also the same type of CCI symptoms that we've been discussing here. Um, 
headaches. You can have uh, dizziness, loss of balance, depending on which joints are involved. Uh, you can also have problems with vision, uh, problems with tachycardia, all of those same things. Andy, have you done posterior PRP or PICL in EDS patients who also have POTS? Many, 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 many. Uh, probably uh, treated hundreds of patients at this point in that, uh, that meet that description. Um, EDS patients with POTS uh, who have CCI, who have gotten either posterior PRP or PICL or both. And really with PICL, it's posterior and anterior almost always. Delicia, did my stand-up MRI for the next September? Do I need to do another to see if there are change, changes in the cervical spine? Probably not. Uh, Yolaine, uh, do you sometimes see patients with uh, intracranial hypertension that have severe migraine caused by vibrations when traveling? If so, considering there's a lot of restricted medication for stem cells treatment, what medication do you take to be able to travel and prevent brain inflammation? Well, I think we need to break that question down. Um, so the first issue would be, is it the intracranial hypertension that's causing the headaches? Um, so intracranial hypertension is a difficult diagnosis to make. The only accurate way to make it would be to float a catheter from usually the low back um, or the neck up into the brain and measure the pressure there. Short of that, um, I don't uh, there's really no way to get to intracranial hypertension by measuring the pressure in a lumbar puncture. So that's the first thing. Uh, you know, I've met a lot of patients who claim to have headaches from intracranial hypertension, but all they have is pressures from an, uh, an opening on a lumbar puncture. Um, and that wouldn't be the way you would measure that pressure. You've got to use the pressure monitor and put it all the way up into the brain to get that measurement. So of the people who have uh, we state they have intracranial hypertension, probably less than 1% actually have that diagnosis based on a catheter placed into the brain. So if we're talking about that 1% of patients who legitimately has intracranial hypertension uh, that's confirmed causing their headaches, instead of the other 20 things that can cause headaches from the neck, uh, then you can stay on things like Diamox, for example. Uh, Varendra, can PRP uh, used for ALR and transverse ligaments? We don't use it for ALR transverse ligaments, uh, primarily just because what I talked about there, and that is the number of procedures to get to ligament tightening is so much less using bone marrow concentrate uh, that we want to reduce the number of procedures people have to go through, not maximize them. Uh, Via, how do you treat shallow simple condyles? What is the cause of this? Uh, no real cause. You're just born that way. Um, so what you have to do is tighten down the ligaments because that person is dependent on ligaments and muscles to stabilize. So normally that area would be stabilized by the bone because you've got a shallow ball and socket joint that's providing stability. Without that ball and socket, what you end up having instead is dependence on ligaments and muscles. So if the muscles go south and then the ligaments get lax, you've got to work on those ligaments and, and muscles. So that's doing these types of injection procedures and short of that, a fusion. Uh, Fatchin, which type of instability is more prone to uh, irritate damage, the vagus nerve? Really anything uh, involving uh, C1 or C2 uh, would be in a place to... Uh, irritate the vagus nerve. In addition to that, you'd be surprised at how close the vagus is to the undersurface of the sternocleidomastoid. So that's another one that really doesn't get talked about very much, but I think can cause some issues. And that is when you get a tight sternocleidomastoid due to C1-C2 instability, is the vagus getting irritated at C1-C2 or is it getting irritated under the SCM? Um, and we've started to treat some vagus nerves uh, with platelet lysate hydrodissection under the SCM uh, to see if we can move the needle on some patients with vagus type tachycardia. Arno, I've had potential CCI for three years. How big is the risk that my neurological symptoms are not reversible? You know, that's really dependent on the person. I think what we tend to see is when patients have this for longer, 
they tend to fall into two camps. One camp is uh, the good news is that they don't really seem to get a reversible damage. Um, you can sort of rescue them from the abyss, if you will. Um, and then there's another camp that does get neurologic damage over time, in which case it's much harder to affect change in those patients. Thatchin, can something like a specific nerve irritation cause lack of salivation in patients with CCI? Yes, we have seen that, or excessive as well. Isabella, is it normal that symptoms can initially get worse before they become better with posterior PRP, mainly tinnitus and blurry vision for me? How long does it take to get positive results? Um, Isabella, I would need to know more about what you got, meaning that um, posterior PRP describes about a dozen different, very, very different procedures. So I'd need to know specifically what was injected, how it was injected, who performed the procedures, uh, used guidance, didn't use guidance. If it's x-ray, did they use contrast, digital subtraction, angiography, all of that stuff. Thatchin, uh, would some of the with EDS cause CCI have all the subtypes of CCI by default since it wouldn't make sense to have laxative one ligament but not others close by? Um, maybe. Usually what we tend to see with CCI patients is they all have some laxity in lots of different joints. And again, different for different types of EDS, right? You've got EDS type subtypes that have more spinal instability, EDS subtypes that have more peripheral joint instability, et cetera. Um, but then something happens, uh, and it's usually a fairly minor thing that damages one set of ligaments more than the other, and then they start to get symptoms. That's been my experience, at least. Uh, Isabel. Uh, I'm a 32-year-old woman who has EDS, CCI, SI joint instability, chronic migraines, POTS. Oh, yeah, I think I, I got this one already. Uh, answered it already here, Isabel. Rosalind, is, uh, if there are large interspinous distances, I'm petite with 5 millimeters between mine except C1-C2 is 13 millimeters and C1-C0 is 12 millimeters. My CXA is 129. Do you recommend the neck brace of PRP to ensure the gaps close? Um, the problem with using a neck brace is that it's a two-edged sword. You damage the muscles, but you might help the ligaments. And since muscles and ligaments are both needed for stability, then damaging one to help the other doesn't make much sense to me. Um, uh, as far as a CXA of 129, then that can be treated with posterior ligaments, assuming that's the only thing going on, meaning that there isn't or, or there aren't other types of CCI that have yet to be diagnosed. Uh, but you will need to make sure the provider can get into the PAOM and do that under x-ray guidance with contrast to make sure that they're just in the PAOM and not going through the dura. Um, so, um, so that's the kind of thing you would need. And then as far as closing distances, the distances might be more or less important uh, depending on what else is going on. So I'm not so concerned about the distances as I am trying to use the best thing possible to provide that stability. Um, so is that bone marrow concentrate? Is that PRP? Is that prolotherapy? and then trying to make sure we hit the right structures to get the best stability, which would require x-ray guidance in that case with, with contrast. Arno, uh, sorry for being vague. I just received a medical report from Med Serena saying that there is a complete exposure of C2 facet. I'm going to turn my head to the right. Yeah, so Arno, I think I need to take a look at the images myself. Uh, I think what they're talking about is C1-C2 rotation and exposure of the joint. Uh, there, you know, there is uh, a paper that was just published oh, probably a month ago or so that talks about that joint exposure and instability. Um, so happy to you know, take a look at the films. That would be during uh, something like a uh, telemedicine. Eric, could this kind of skull tilt backwards instability cause your muscles to go all soft? I think. I get a scary muscle dysfunction that makes inner neck muscles go soft. I get it in degrees. If I get it too bad, I must immediately lie down and even my lumbar and rest of the spine go soft. So I'm not 
quite sure what you mean by soft. You mean the muscles turn off? Let's see how BMC is one, two treatments compared to others. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. I think we went through it already with the Prolo at six to eight uh, visits for SI joint instability. And then for PRP, three to four visits. And then for BMC, bone marrow concentrate, uh, one to two. Um, Rosalind, what percentage of your patients have substantial brain fog, cognitive impairment, later report their function normally again? Um, again, about 70%. So that's the same number for all of the more common CCI type symptoms, headaches, imbalance, uh, brain fog, um, et cetera. ERA, an upright comb beam CT is what CCI neurosurgeon in Barcelona uses. If you use that, it doesn't have to be an upright MRI. Yeah, so they're looking for different things. They're heavily focused on concepts like vertical instability. Um, so not really. We're going to need to see movement-based imaging. Now, if that's a cone beam CT, for example, with rotation, uh, the good news is that should be less uh, x-ray exposure than the average CT, um, then we might be able to use that. Uh, but it'd have to be with motion. Uh, and that that's one of the advantages of an upright MRI or a DMX. It's with motion. So that's the key part with motion. Uh, Becky, Erickson, you mentioned that you thought patients experiencing pupil dilation, unilateral, I believe, maybe due to rotation of the uh, superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. What is happening structurally when you're seeing this? Thank you. Yeah, so that's the ganglion that's responsible for changing pupil diameter. Um, and so if the ganglion is uh, blocked, um, you tend to see, meaning if you just inject numbing medicine into it or if you cut it, then you would see the pupil uh, get really, really tiny. Uh, that's called meiosis. If uh, the ganglion is just getting irritated, uh, the pupil can get bigger, letting in more light. Um, so it'd be ganglion irritation is usually what we would see uh, because obviously the ganglion is not getting damaged um, to the point of dying off, which would, which would be what happens when you uh, inject numbing medicine around the ganglion and numb it out. Bethany, hi, Erickson. You started your study of injecting a swollen bursa yet to see if it helps with headache relief. Um, yeah, Bethany, we would be interested in doing that um, if you would be interested in coming out. Uh, so that's something we could certainly do um, and uh, take a look at. It's not something that anyone's ever done before, um, and it would require a PICL type approach to do it um, since it's more for information gathering. Um, we would probably put it on a day where there was maybe a blank slot or something like that. We wouldn't charge anyone for it. We're more interested in just trying to prove out the theory. And it is a theory at this point that that bursal swelling up here is actually what is more commonly causing pressure headache than intracranial hypertension. Uh, Jim, uh, is 10x PRP amber okay on loose ligaments for a 24-year-old? Had 10x on my suboccipital tendons and had great results, but using 10x makes sense on ligaments and had good results with tendons. Um, sure, yeah, that would be fine. Uh, again, remember, I think we talked before about inhibition. Uh, we weren't sure if the inhibition we were seeing in the lab was related to an actual effect or not. So listen, if it didn't cause inhibition and it worked well for you, go for it. Kimmy, what causes the C2 to be stuck? I've heard of a wandering C2, uh, but what do we do about it being resistant to AO or other adjustments? Um, yeah, I mean, any joint, if it's loose enough, can get into positions that are so unnatural that things kind of get jammed. Um, so that's usually what it is we're talking about there. Now, let's say if you had an awful lot of C1, C2 overhang, for example, or C1, C2 rotation, you know, just have to realize in the C1, C2 joint, 
I'm not sure how to get my hands in the right place, guys. Sorry about that. It's two concave surfaces on each other. And uh, when you, they're supposed to be held pretty closely towards the top of the hill, if you will. So one of these is C1 and one of them is C2. But they get stuck when the ligament is loose to go all the way down the hill. So you've got two convex joint surfaces that get misaligned and it feels like they're stuck because in a way they are. Um, they're supposed to be held in close approximation between the muscles and the ligaments. The ligaments are the final line of defense. When the ligaments aren't there uh, or are very loose, then one of those joint surfaces rides down on the other. Uh, era. I have my skull tilting back a lot, cause my inner neck muscles go soft pretty bad. Possible ligaments go soft, no logic. Uh, unlikely that an upright cone beam CT will be enough to make a diagnosis. Um, spontaneous sun. Have you ever had patients, especially HEDS patients, respond better to prolo than PRP? Do you find HEDS patients tend to be slower to heal with PRP or an average? What about EDS and stem cells? Yeah, that's a good story because my uh, niece has a rare uh, HEDS subtype. Uh, and she had her whole genome sequenced because she was a professor at Cambridge at the time. And uh, so for her, um, PRP didn't work. Now, again, she's got a very rare subtype. And produces uh, a defect that uh, produces a defect in in one type rare type of collagen, um, but for her prolo worked better, bone marrow concentrate worked better, and PRP didn't work as well. So there likely are uh, genetic subtypes of EDS where um, one of those three or two of those three work better than others. Sharon Hirson, you know how to explain the fact. Swaying dizziness CCI gets better in passive motion, such as driving. Swaying dizziness gets better in passive motion, such as driving. I don't know. That's not what I typically hear from most of my patients. Um, I don't really hear what tends to make that kind of thing better other than keeping their head straight. What I tend to hear is usually what makes it worse. So many times in many of my patients, driving will make their dizziness worse or walking down a grocery store aisle when you have to turn your head, look at all the different boxes, etc. That'll make things worse, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know how to say that first name. Siran, Siran maybe. I'm going for an upright MRI very soon as I'm in the UK. Will it affect your ability to review the imaging of holding an atlas adjustment during the scans? Um, Probably not. Shouldn't make a big difference in what it is we're looking for. Uh, Rosalind, when you said about finding a practitioner who uses the proper safe guidance to inject 0112 and does about 100 years, is that you? Yeah, we're the only place on the face of the earth I know that does 100 of those injections a year. Um, and I'm going to give you a scary story here, but it's a true story um, and a very unfortunate story. Um, you know, it wasn't just last year uh, and and before that, that we had picked out maybe five or six places around the country that we thought did enough of these injections to actually refer patients to. And by enough, a couple of dozen a year, maybe 20 a year. And I realized the average interventional pain doctor probably does has done five of these, maybe 10 of these in their whole career. So that's a lot. Um, referred uh, well, actually, I didn't make that referral. Another physician made that referral out to a doc that we thought was qualified. This doctor had done other procedures for us. Uh, but this is a very technically demanding procedure. And inadvertently, he stuck the needle in the brainstem and injected. Um, that patient, as far as I know, is I think now out of, of inpatient rehab, but is has, you know, had a had a one-sided stroke on that side of her body. Um, so it's a young person with a stroke who's probably never going to function fully again, simply because there wasn't enough experience to identify um, in a patient, and I know this patient, this patient is extremely difficult to position, 
to be able to say, hey, I need to abandon this procedure because I can't get the person in the right uh, position or I'm not seeing everything clearly because the patient is difficult to position. Um, so, yes, this is real stuff. It's not, I'm not just making this stuff up. Um, it happens. Um, and it happens because these are highly and heavily technically demanding procedures, even for the most experienced interventionalists and even the most experienced interventionalists on earth have only done a few dozen of these in their whole career. Um, so anyway, that's a real story. And I, and I wish it wasn't true, but it is. Bethany, if someone has severe cervical stenosis at 5'6", cutting off CSF and showing no white around the cord, can this cause intracranial hypertension? Um, no, generally not. Um, so that wouldn't be a cause of intracranial hypertension um, uh, given the mechanics of how that would work. Uh, that would be more a problem with uh, a low CXA and cervical medullary syndrome much, much higher up. Um, so unlikely to be uh, the cause. Spontaneous son, you're okay. Or the doctor does the PICL procedure. That's it. Well, uh, Dr. Schultz does it as well. Dr. Pitts will do a few. Um, I've, I've obviously got the most experience out there because I was the one that developed the procedure um, and been doing it since 2015 um, and have continued to advance it. Eric, does this type of CCI show up in a supine MRI at all? Are there clues or nothing at all? No, there's definitely clues. I mean, we, we see those clues all the time. Um, let's say the last 10 telemedicine visits I've done in the last two weeks or so, maybe last seven days, um, we found all sorts of clues on normal or normal supine MRIs. So those clues can definitely be there. Now, Many times we just get suggestions of this person probably has CCI, a swollen 01 facet joint, for example, or swelling in the bursa um, that shouldn't be there, or swelling in some of the upper cervical bones, etc. Um, so, as I always say, I'll take all the information I can get. So, if you want to go get another study, um, I'll either request it specifically if I need it. But if a patient comes to me and says, should I go get that study or this study? Heck, I'll take anything I can get and, and more information may not give me any more diagnostic certainty, but it's always better to look at more information than less. Stefan, uh, Dr. Centeno, which treatment is more successful from your point of view? The Atlas therapy, according to Arlen, or the AO orthogonal therapy, do you recommend these treatments directly for after stem cells are weighted a bit. Um, the two that we most commonly use would be uh, chiropractic AO therapy or NUCA. Uh, and uh, patients can do those right after a bone marrow concentrate PICL procedure. Uh, so in fact, many of our patients will get that done by uh, local AO doctors right afterwards. Uh, Sharon, uh, are there patients who anatomically can't have a normal curve? Sure. One of the things that can happen is you can, over time, you can start to see that the, the bones change shape and kind of turn into trapezoids. Obviously, once they turn into trapezoids with the small part facing forward, you're never going to get a normal curve back in that person. So it's one of the reasons why you want to get working on this stuff, because eventually the bones respond and start to change shape. Sharon, can loss of curve be more symptom causer than the instability itself? Um, I like to say it's throwing uh, gasoline on the bonfire, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, a loss of curve is going to put a lot of direct pressure on these ligaments. And uh, Evan Katz, one of the chiropractors we work with and the guy who does our DMXs, um, he had just published a paper and a case series of patients that had instability, um, you know, relatively mild to moderate instability. It was due to a car crash. So it was still in that healing phase. And by getting the curve back, some of those patients got to heal that instability. Now, obviously, that's not going to work if someone's had this for a year and it's more severe, but 
it's certainly not helping things. And so we often tell our patients to, um, you know, that can tolerate it to get curve restoration. And if they can't get curve restoration because they can't tolerate it, then get stabilization first and then curve restoration. Kimmy, what are your thoughts on creating a sacral? Uh, my neck muscles are atrophied, but also feel tight. I'm sure what to do other than stretching a massage like any else, strengthening the muscles. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Catherine, have you treated many CRPS patients for injections can spread it? Um, well, certainly a CRPS patient. So just so people understand what that is, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, type one and type two. Uh, so when a patient has CRPS, they tend to have uh, very, very high pain responses with a low stimulus. Um, and on top of that, they usually have a sympathetic component, meaning uh, changes in skin color, um, that sort of thing, what's called pseudomotor or vasomotor responses. So uh, CRPS itself can be treated through sympathetic blocks, um, and many of those patients do pretty well or injecting the same kind of things that we inject epidural, platelet lysate uh, around the sympathetic chain. Uh, if you're going to do sort of willy-nilly injections though in a CRPS patient, that's gotta be done very carefully because they will tend to dramatically flare up versus other patients given the same exact injection. So it's a little bit like the fragile egg concept that we talk about here or what we call central sensitization. CRPS is like that, but magnified times 10. So it's all about uh, focused therapy in those patients, trying to be careful not to push them into that flare up state. Uh, so for a CRPS patient or essentially a sensitized patient, less is more. Um, the problem is when that person goes to a clinic that lets, likes to inject lots of things, then they're more likely to get a thermonuclear flare-up, um, which is not good for CRPS patient. Era, I have a symptom that causes breathing to be hard and breathing goes very slow. It seems to be a kind of diaphragm issue, whatever is in the area of the belly up to the solar plexus. Is this related to a specific vertebral level compression? It could be, it could be related to problems in the ribs or problems in the, in the thoracic spine. In that case, the lower thoracic spine. It also could be related to phrenic nerve issues in the neck. So those are some things to think about. Uh, Sharon, does PICL cause temporary swelling of the transverse ligament? If it's the case, if there's not a massive symptom increase, if one has a retroflex the dontoid and less room for CSF. Yeah, Sharon, I looked at that uh, probably three or four years ago, maybe before the pandemic, beginning of the pandemic, you know, it's funny, we were all now going to measure our lives uh, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and post-pandemic. So we now have a, a ruler in which to do that by. Um, but I looked at that and I couldn't see a relationship. Um, so my theory at the time was similar to yours, was that is it possible that these patients that have more cervical medullary syndrome, more of a retroflex dens, a bigger panis, were getting a bigger flare-up? Uh, didn't pan out. So I uh, looked at about 20 or 30 patients, couldn't see any clear trend. So I kind of abandoned the idea. Isabel, have you had patients with HEDS, CCI, and MACS use bone marrow concentrate? What sort of inflammation response do they have? Also, the pelvis is compromised, six labrum tears, SI joint dislocation, shallow hip sockets. Can you still take bone marrow? Um, so let's go backwards. So taking bone marrow is not from that area. So that's not an issue. Um, in general. Um, and I would say that, oh, maybe one in four of our PICL patients now have HEDS, CCI, and, and, and uh, MCAS. Um, and um, certainly work with those patients on reducing flare up. Sometimes we'll give them an antihistamine during the procedure, et cetera. But usually, uh, not an issue. They tend to be more likely to be in the longer term flare up. So rather than days, they might be in the week's time frame on the flare up side. Um, but that's about it. Um, now, again, just like we talked about in centrally sensitized patients or patients that have, have that pro-inflammatory type phenotype, 
less is more. Um, so I just saw one of those patients this week and all we did was PICL from the front, which is rare. We almost always do front and back to keep her in one position. And we did a very minimal version of the PICL just below Atlas because, you know, there was, we could tell based on the pressure to pain readings that we got during the initial evaluation that that person was not going to tolerate more. Um, so again, in those patients in general, less is more until they can tolerate more. Let's see, uh, and I'm probably gonna go about 10 more minutes. We're at around an hour and 10 minutes right now. So about 10 more minutes here. Um, Dr. Centeno, what is your opinion on neutral spine alignment, specific PT, upper cervical chiro adjustments and continued wearing cervical collar post PICL? Most upper cervical chiro opinions steer towards wearing collar minimizing movement period, including during zero PT, PT specialized neutral spine alignment, series of absolutely getting out of collar, ASAP due to muscle atrophy. Uh, yeah, I don't believe in collars. Um, you know, again, uh, the uh, stability is 50% ligaments and 50% muscles. We know that ever since the work of uh, Punjabi at Yale in the 80s. Um, so these are not new concepts. Uh, bottom line is that you need uh, ligaments and muscles. So trying to get one better while sacrificing the other doesn't make much sense to me. So no, I don't believe in the idea of putting someone in a collar long term. Now, having said that, if someone needs a collar for a couple of days after the procedure, I had a patient like that this week, she felt like she needed a collar um, in the PACU. We gave her one. She used it for one night and then threw it away. Um, that's fine. Or if someone needs a collar during special circumstances, like if they're going to travel, that's fine. But wearing a collar 24-7, 365 is almost always a really bad idea. Uh, Isabella, my PRP treatment was done by Dr. Kirkor. Uh, let's see, Isabella, I got to remember now, let me go back here to what it was we were discussing. I can make sure you this. that's the same person. No, that's not the same person. Uh, so Isabella, uh, better, I'm not, not finding your initial question. I think you were uh, the one maybe using a different account now that was talking to me about the C1, C2 overhang going down, um, but I'm not sure. So I uh, can't find your original question up there. I apologize. Maybe throw something else down here to, to reorient, me, reorient me since I've done a couple or about 50 questions so far. Uh, Andres, is it possible that some could have laxity and not have symptoms? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Andres, this is a great topic to bring up and one that I tried to go through um, many, many times uh, a day with patients. And that is there's the concept of diagnostic certainty. That means that we, we are fairly certain that the instability we're seeing on the imaging is causing your symptoms. And that's an equation, right? That's a calculus that involves how they got injured, what their symptoms are, what makes their symptoms better, what makes their symptoms worse. Uh, do, do their symptoms match CCI? Uh, what is the response to treatment? What's on their physical exam? Does it localize the upper cervical spine? Um, all of those things have to have check marks by them in order to get to high diagnostic certainty that what we're seeing on the images is causing the problems. Um, I think where patients get in trouble is to assume that since it's on the images, they must have a problem and it's not always the case at all. Jennifer, what uh, with vision loss caused by high ICP from CCI, have you seen patients get their vision back? Um, uh, I don't think that we've seen many patients with vision loss from high ICP. Um, so that would be a diagnosis through an ophthalmologist where it's very clear that um, there's um, pressure on the optic disc on a direct eye exam. Um, 
So usually vision loss wouldn't be caused by that mechanism, It'd be much more likely to be caused by lack of proprioceptive input to smooth pursuit or things like irritation of the, of the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. Um, so Jennifer, I'd have to know more. Now we have lots of visual issues that have improved with the procedure, um, but uh, that one, that diagnosis can't be made, you know, like at a prolotherapist office, for example, that one would need to be made by a neuro-ophthalmologist. So I, I would need to know more. Isabella, my PRP, yeah, I, got, I got that, Dr. Kirkor, C0, but I need to know what the original question was about Isabella. Uh, Arno, could you quickly share with us how much time medicine would cost? Also, if you could, is the exposure to C2% when turning a strong indication? So, yeah, Arno, we talked about that. So I would need to see, uh, look at that. So telemedicine, it's my understanding, runs $275. Um, and uh, happy to look at those images to see specifically what's going on there. Rhymes, except the PICL, are there any treatments with anterior injection or lateral injection? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, so when it comes to injecting these anterior ligaments in the higher cervical spine, only the PICL would get there. Um, uh, now there are lower cervical anterior treatments to get like the anterior longitudinal ligament. And that's more of that level four type treatment, not level five. Um, so that requires ultrasound guidance, x-ray guidance, contrast, and someone who's experienced in doing cervical discography. Um, Ulysses, I meant can BMC make ligaments uh, heal super faster than PRP? Oh, uh, probably not faster, just uh, fewer treatments. Era, so for this skull tilted backwards type of CCI, you said the MRI is better than DMX. So I, so I meant, would you prefer the upright MRI inflection? Oh, no, yeah, the MRI inflection extension would be far better than a cone beam CT. Um, yeah, no, Ron doesn't do these injections. Um, sorry, that, that one's not accurate. Um, uh, so we're talking about injections that, uh, require, um, different expertise than the type that Ron has. And when it comes to the PICL, definitely not doing that. Uh, when it comes to injecting things like zero one, uh, I wouldn't send a patient to Ron for that. Um, so uh, definitely not accurate with what we've been talking about here today. Uh, Ulysses, how many vertebral artery cases you heard of so far because of bad experience of upper facet joints? Oh, there's a number out there. Um, you know, this was my, well, this wasn't a vertebral artery. This was a brainstem injection. Um, so again, we just talked about inexperienced providers in the upper cervical spine. You know, this was a provider who I would have thought was experienced enough to do this, but I know this patient, this patient is extremely difficult to work with, um, extremely difficult to position. And um, so, um, yeah, that's the first brainstem I've heard of. Now, vertebral artery injections, um, if you just look in the literature, you'll find them, they're out there. Uh, people have published on them. So these things are hard to do. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to take select questions because we're getting a little long in the tooth here. Uh, Alicia, can you do NUCA with instability and subluxation complex prior to stem cell? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Robert, can you elaborate on trapezoid shape? I've seen a few patients with one condyle that looked like a triangle. Oh, I meant more in the vertebral bodies than in the zero one joint here, Robert. Um, so um, now if they had that kind of zero one, there was probably something else going on. Something like we'll see that sometimes with rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, Isabel, have you had patients try dynamic neural retraining after injections? If so. You know, I have not specifically, now I'm sure I've had several patients do that, but I uh, have not specifically talked to them about it. So um, 
certainly open to seeing how patients do with that type of approach because I think the general idea is sound. Uh, Siran is having PSL treatment with one year of injury considered early treatment. It is. Finn, diagnostically, how to differentiate lax capture ligaments from, say, lax posterior anterior ligaments. Presumably, it's harder to diagnose because you can't just look at the direction of the thesis. Um, yeah, it would depend on what it is we're looking at. So realize that the facet capsules are pretty weak. Um, so, for example, the medial facet capsules at C4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7 are frequently not there and incompetent by the time someone is in their 30s and 40s. Um, in fact, we often take advantage of that to inject into those lower cervical facets and get into the epidural space without having to go into the epidural space itself. Um, so um, it depends on what we're talking about. Now, if we're talking about things like one, two facet capsular ligaments, um, you're not going to be able to differentiate that at all. Um, there's really no way to get there from there. Um, as far as uh, anterior ligaments and other things, that's a combination of looking at DMX uh, and often their upright flexion extension MRI and sometimes their, their usual MRI, et cetera. Then in your presentation, the translational diagram, I'm correct in understanding this is the same thing as translational BAI. Uh, yes, it is a similar concept. Uh, so again, looking at uh, just any reference point between the dens and the skull, and then measuring that translational or lateral movement. Ulysses, I heard people who are in a collar for the last, uh, yeah, I got that. The Ulysses, I'm going to try to take some specific ones here. I think people with heavy head need to use hard collars, probably because they don't overwork or tense their muscles up. Um, yeah, just make sure it's as little as humanly possible. Uh, I think that's the the right answer. Uh, okay, that was the one. Uh, sorry, Isabella, I had missed that one up there. It's normal that symptoms can actually get worse before they get better. Um, they can. You can certainly go through a flare-up uh, period before things improve. Um, and from a posterior PRP, depending on what was injected, I think you had said zero through seven. Um, in that case, you'd be looking at somewhere between three to six weeks to get to uh, the other side of that kind of thing. Now, if there's a, a, a flare-up longer than that, then uh, that could be a concern that you're in that central sensitization category. Um, or maybe we're just not hitting the right things. Again, you know, if you have certain types of instability, those poster injections aren't going to be effective as we talked about this. Uh, let's see this initial question. There's two. To, yeah, I got that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take a few select ones here. That's an interesting one. Can deformation of the dorsal end plate at C3 as caused by CCI or is that considered congenital? That's a good question. I'd have to take a look at what the end plate looked like um, to see. Normally, we wouldn't see end plate uh, breaks in the cervical spine. That's something more common as either congenital um, or part and parcel of tall person disease, if you will, or Schurman's disease um, and uh, breaks in the thoracic end plates. But an upper cervical to mid cervical end plate break is probably traumatic unless there's some sort of serious congenital deformity. Uh, Catherine, sure, Catherine. Okay, guys, I think we've been going almost two and a half hours or one and a half hours here. Let's talk. Uh, so, one and a half hours. And uh, I want to thank everyone for their time. Again, today we talked about that skull shifting on C1 and that type of instability. I will be here uh, this Monday and then I'll be out uh, this uh, week from today just because uh, my uh, wife's stepmother passed away. So we're going to go to that memorial uh, in, in Atlanta. So uh, thanks so much for watching. Everyone have a great weekend. Uh, love the great questions. Um, again, 
Uh, I don't know about you, but I learned by asking questions and getting answers. And uh, so I hope you do as well. And I will see you this Monday. Thank you.